Welcome to another The History Of video. We recently posted a poll in the community tab with a few options to choose from, and the one that received the most votes was that of the US Army Normandy Assault Vest, used for a short period towards the end of World War II. However, as we researched the topic, it became clear that this vest and that of the British Battle Jerkin share something of a similar history. So we decided to do both. Prepare for another two-parter. June 6, 1944, the start of Operation Overlord. It was here that a joint Allied invasion of the Normandy region of France was seen, effectively creating another front in the European theater against the Axis powers. Just about everyone knows the story of D-Day and its significance to the war. However, what isn't as known are certain elements like sparsely seen vests used by a select number of forces. A few different ones were seen, the assault vest worn by the US troops, and two versions of the battle jerkin by British and Canadian forces. Though these vests saw some of the most extensive use during the landings, the battle jerkins were not limited to being used during that time, but instead began being seen as early as 1942. At the time, British and Commonwealth forces were using the 1937 pattern webbing equipment, a newer load-bearing system composed of suspenders, a haversack, holsters, and a number of pouches for various magazines and accessories, which had been their go-to system since its introduction in the opening year of World War II, 1939. Although it was used on a massive scale, its reception was at times mixed. Many found the webbing hard to customize and annoying to use. One individual who is not too fond of the design was Chief Ordnance Officer of Field Stores Aldershot, Colonel E.R. Rivers McPherson. And so, in 1942, he unveiled his concept for the battle jerkin, describing it as a simple and easy-fitting garment on the lines of a poacher's jacket. Now, his idea of a battle jerkin wasn't new in the sense of a recently invented garment, but rather applying it to the battlefield as a part of a direct combat uniform. Jerkins, which have been around since the 1500s, in their most basic form are sleeveless jackets often made out of leather. Starting in World War I, the British began issuing insulated jerkins to troops to allow warmth without sacrificing mobility or flexibility, which one would lose with traditional coats and larger, more cumbersome insulating clothing. Naturally, the idea of incorporating the benefits of a jerkin with the needs of military equipment would soon cross paths. So, why was the colonel so opposed to the webbing equipment? Well, that was more or less laid out in a pamphlet written by him that accompanied the jerkin. In it, he stated that web gear had not evolved much in the last hundred or so years, and went on to make the claim that most infantry officers viewed the 37 webbing as clumsy, noisy, restricting of mobility, difficult to get through obstacles, allowing no flexibility for weapons, cramping, uncomfortable, and galling to the soldier. McPherson believed that warfare had evolved to a point where troops needed gear and equipment that could keep up with the pace of battle. Webbing had been introduced when warfare was slower, i.e. volley firing and line infantry during the 17 and 1800s. The pamphlet went on to essentially lay out his entire reasoning for the jerkin in great detail, but it essentially boiled down to the following. Equipment should be customizable for the individual or terrain they were operating in, be silent, have a more balanced center of gravity ensuring more comfort, ease of use, and mobility, and perhaps most importantly be easy and quick to put on and take off. And so in 1942 the patent was submitted, the jerkin was made, and trials began. They were made out of a waterproof duck cloth fabric which could be dyed various colors for different environments, such as the two main colors seen, a dark chocolate brown for temperate terrains such as Europe, and a tan color for sandy or arid ones. In addition, they were made in three sizes, small, medium, and large. So let's take an in-depth and close-up look at the various aspects of these jerkins and what each section was intended for. Keep in mind though, through its short lifespan, a few slight modifications were made based on feedback and production. Starting off, we have two easy to use securing straps, one small one towards the chest and one down by the waist. Next were two curved pouches referred to as universal pockets. These were curved to accommodate Bren magazines, two in each to be exact. They could expand out to a maximum of two inches and alternatively be used for storing a flare gun or sidearm and its ammunition, six grenades, five Sten magazines, a hundred rounds of ammunition for small arms, wire cutters, a boy's anti-tank rifle magazine, six Thompson magazines, or field glasses. But again, they were called universal pockets, so one could really put anything in them much like the other sections of the jerkin. 
a small slot was seen on the wearer's left side, which could accommodate an SMLE or short magazine Lee Enfield bayonet. On the wearer's right side, a small angled strap was seen, which allowed a pistol holster to be attached. Along the waist on both the left and right side saw two more pouches that extended two inches out as well. Both were used for grenades, canteens, a few slabs of gun cotton, a low order explosive, or two small mortar rounds. In front of the left one, a small slot was seen which one could attach the number four Lee Enfield scabbard. On each shoulder, there were a set of washers which granted the ability to attach smaller items by way of strings. The upper back saw a larger pack which included a form of adjusters on the inside to allow expansion or compression. The pamphlet highlighted its ability to store two days of rations, blankets, cutlery, mugs, canteens, a gas cape, or extra ammunition. To the wearer's right side next to the pack, the inclusion of another utility sleeve was seen, which was intended to be used for a machete or mortar sleeve. On the opposite side was another smaller sleeve intended to be used for holding smaller entrenching tool handles or toggle rope. Below the pack were three rectangular shaped holes which allowed for ventilation as well as the ability to attach additional pieces of equipment or gear. Below the main pack towards the lower section of the back was a smaller pouch. This part wasn't directly connected to the jerkin much like the other pouches but rather was an independent one connected by way of two straps which were stitched between the back vents. This was intended for mortar bombs or an e-tool head. Finally, on the inside were two sections. Located on the wearer's right-hand side was a pocket in the same shape as the universal ones, which could be used to store personal items, maps, or message books. And on the back, by the free-floating pouch, was a section referred to as the soft kit that had an open 8-inch deep pocket which could be used to store extra shirts, socks, underwear, and so on, which would ensure it was kept drier than the outside sections and provided a little extra padding for the wearer. Again, these were the main aspects of the jerkin, but over the trial period, a few minor differences or modifications were done to them. Large-scale testing began with the 54th East Anglican Infantry Division in August 1942, with further testing being done by 40 Commando of the Royal Marines later that year. Reports were generally positive, saying it did what it was supposed to do. The waterproofing worked both passively and actively, users had better ease of movement, it was less intrusive, lighter, and didn't snag on items or require much adjusting. It was quieter, better at camouflaging the wearer, and was easy to put on and take off. The biggest issue, however, was that the vest's material was viewed unfavorably by wearers. It caused many to overheat in hotter temperatures, with others finding it too stiff for comfort. Some even voiced how they were unsightly and only good for combat operations, whereas web gear could be used by all types of forces. Because of this, the 1937 webbing remained the standard issue load-bearing system. But, in January 1943, 19,000 jerkins were ordered to be used by select units, such as, but not limited to, commandos, beach landing parties, and arctic forces. Some of the earliest sightings of these on combat troops were seen during the Sicily landings in July of 1943, with a large majority of them being utilized by forces who participated in the Normandy invasion. During all of this, the design made its way to Canada, where roughly 1,500 jerkins were produced for troops. Some of the main differences between these was that they featured different securing systems for the pouches and straps, two angled straps to hang a holster from either side, an altered back vent design, and tan-colored edge taping. Strangely enough, none were issued to forces participating in the D-Day landings, but were rather used for training by a variety of units from infantry to airborne in the months leading up to the operation. However, when the time came, members of the 3rd Infantry Division, Royal Canadian Navy Beach Commando W, the 1st Battalion of the Canadian Scottish Regiment, the Royal Winnipeg Rifles, and the Queen's Own Rifles were issued British ones for the landings. So why were these only seen in large numbers on beach operations such as D-Day, and why were so few ordered in the first place. Well, as we mentioned earlier, these were approved for beach landing forces, and the planners of the Normandy invasion wanted troops to carry two days' worth of supplies with them, which the jerkin was advertised as being able to do. Additionally, trudging through water and sand, the waterproof, lightweight, and non-constricting design would be a benefit to members of the landing parties. However, this wasn't often the case, as many wearers who used the jerkins would often ditch them after reaching the shore, as they were too heavy, cumbersome, and uncomfortable. Because of this, many abandoned pieces were finally their ways into the hands of other units and sometimes even German forces. In regards to the small numbers produced, the jerkin just didn't seem to make the cut as a general issue item. The 1937 webbing had been standard issue since 1939 and with the war going on, large scale numbers of it had already been made and distributed. Switching all forces over to a new system would have been a massive undertaking. But there was another factor at play. 
a second type of battle jerkin, known by many names such as the Skeleton Assault Jerkin, Bren Harness, and the Bren Bra. These jerkins were a much more simplified version. These were used alongside the standard jerkin but on a much larger scale. First seen the same year as the standard version, 1942, the first iteration of the skeleton jerkin was made of the same material and in the same three sizes as the battle jerkin, but had everything but the universal pouches and two securing straps stripped away. Additionally, a bayonet frog was added on the lower waist section to accept scabbards. The second iteration saw a few minor changes which were the doing away with the three sizes in favor of adjusters located on the back strap and on both sides of the waist by way of eyelets and string. Two buckles were added to the back waist which was used to attach specialty pouches and carriers for items such as canteens and e-tools. The bayonet frog was removed in favor of two loops on the left side pouch. And finally the most significant being the orientation of the two pouches were flipped so that they were now curved inwards instead of outwards. These jerkins were a lot more positively received and unlike the standard version were kept by many forces who received them. This was likely due to them being a lot lighter, having a much smaller surface area, and being easily modified as well as used with other equipment. They saw use up until the end of the war by mostly commandos and other special forces, but also by other allied units such as the Polish 3rd Rifle Division. Today, all these are quite collectible, with their merits and detriments still somewhat debated. There are those who say they were just limited use pieces that worked in some areas, but not all, while others say they were ahead of their time and helped lead many militaries around the world to develop various load-bearing vests and systems as the century progressed. However, what is agreed upon is that the Battle Jerkin's creation helped inspire another short-lived piece used during the war, the U.S. Assault Vest, which we will be going over in this second part. So click the subscribe button and make sure your bell notification is turned on, or just check back soon for it and other videos right here on Uniform History.